Hello, Father Mitch Packard, and welcome to EWTN Live. We bring you guests from around the world. And tonight, we're talking about something pretty important. How to explain and defend your Catholic faith in conversation with your Protestant friends and family, but without the need of a very heady theological or philosophical degree from some prestigious seminary or religious studies program or even from a bad one. Uh, just use some good common sense, simple logic, and keep it rooted in the Word of God, sacred, sacred Scripture. Before we get to that discussion, we'll have to give you an update on what's happening with EWTN Radio. For that, we turn to Jack Williams from our radio department. Ray, Jack, what you got going well, for Well, Father us? Mitch, the last time I was here, we were talking about the radio conference that was coming up. Well, it done come up, and we've had the radio conference since yes, we were we last did. together. We had a great time. Yep. Uh, first time we've had it here in Birmingham since 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, we lost a couple years to COVID, and last year we went to Phoenix mm -hmm. uh, and had the radio conference in conjunction with the family celebration. Um, so everybody was excited to be back in, in Birmingham for yeah. sure. Uh, Tuesday night as people arrived, our good partners at Catholic Answers spot, sponsored a little reception for everybody. And then on Wednesday, as we always do, we had a day-long retreat at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament, mm -hmm. uh, which was very nice for everybody to be able to, to go up and do that. When the actual conference itself sort of kicked into gear on Thursday, everybody was welcomed, of course, by our chairman and chief executive officer, Michael Warsaw, mm -hmm. uh, who had a few words to share with the pilgrims. And then we had our keynote address, which was amazing because, you know, we're in the business of evangelization and all these wonderful affiliates around the country that are carrying our programming mm -hmm. are about the business of evangelization. And we had Bishop Michael Sis from the Diocese of San Angelo, Texas. And Bishop Sis was the rector at the Newman Center at Texas A&M when that place started going nuts with uh, all sorts of uh, students uh, overrunning the place to the point this that- This was good nuts. Good nuts, this is, really this is, good nuts. This is a positive thing. That's right, and uh, as shortly after he left, uh, they had to knock the church down and build a bigger one. Yep. And the one that they built is now not big enough to house all the students. So he gave just a wonderful keynote address talking mm -hmm. about evangelization, encouraged the affiliates and everything that they were doing, and it was, it was beautiful. Um, we had, for the remainder of the day, various workshops, and we had our first ever clergy workshop, which you were part of. Mm -hmm. uh, you, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, Deacon Robin Waters from one of our affiliates, very well received. Everybody was very excited about that. I know, I think you all got as much out of it yeah. as everybody else did when we were there. Um, one of the unique features that we had this year is that our good friends at Spirit Catholic Radio brought with them a giant, and when I say giant, I mean half of the pre-functionary of this hotel ballroom setup, was a display of uh, honoring Carlo Acutis and all of the Eucharistic miracles that he had mm -hmm. chronicled uh, on the internet and they were all lined up for everybody to see and it was a, a beautiful opportunity for people to take advantage uh, of that and then of course we wound down as we do every year with our annual awards dinner and banquet uh, where we honor uh, milestone anniversaries uh, for our affiliates we also give uh, production awards for them as they submit production pieces to us and we we vote on those and then uh, this year's uh, Doug Pearson Faithful Warrior Award, which is kind of the culmination of the evening this year, went to uh, Al Cresta from Ave Maria Radio. Uh, so very well, well deserved uh, honor for Al. And then really the big uh, highlight of the, the couple days together is we made the announcement at the end of that awards dinner that coming up in the first part of 2024, we've got a brand new program, Monday through Friday featuring the aforementioned Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. So yes. Beacon of Truth, uh, more information will be coming soon about that, but Deacon Harold uh, is going to be Monday through Friday available to us on EWTN Radio, and we're very excited about that. That'll be an excellent, excellent opportunity. It'll be outstanding. So these are all these affiliates that have answered Mother Angelica's call to obtain radio stations, get them up and running, and carry the programming that Mother provides to them free of charge. So if anybody happens to be in an area where they don't have an AM or FM EWTN affiliated radio station, if they think the Lord might be 
tugging at their heartstrings a little bit to get involved in something like that, all they have to do is send an email to Steve, just to Steve's attention at radio at EWTN.com, radio at EWTN.com, and put it to Steve's attention. He'll get back to you, and we'll see what we can do. All right. Sounds good. Sounds excellent. Thank you. Uh, good update. And we'll be back in a couple of minutes with tonight's guest, so please stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. My guest tonight is here to discuss some logical inconsistencies with the very pillars of Protestant belief, especially the starting points that Luther and Swingley and later Calvin came up with, where it's sola scriptura, that is the Bible alone, and sola fide, faith alone. Uh, they use the Latin because they use everybody used Latin in those days, and our, my guest exposes some of the inconsistencies in the ideas of using the Bible alone or faith alone, and he comes at this by using sacred scripture. The goal is to heal some of the divisions that exist within Christianity. And by healing some of those divisions, we can repair our witness to the non-Christian world. Many of you may be familiar with our guest, as he had once hosted the EWTN Radio Open Line Monday. His other book, uh, Blue Collar Apologetics, was made into an EWTN TV series. And his newest book is A Blue Collar Answer to Protestantism, Catholic Questions Protestants Can't Answer. Please welcome our guest, John Martinoni. Thank you, Father. John, good to have you. Good so, to be here. First of all, why are all your collars blue? <laughs> well, for me, blue collar uh, represents common sense. Okay. And, you know, if you're a plumber, electrician, carpenter, factory worker, you need common sense. Yeah. So blue collar workers to me represent common sense. And, and I, I use the term, I had pro within just a few weeks of, of each other, a few year, several years back, two, three different people emailed me and they were saying, you know, you you really come at it from a blue collar perspective. Come mm -hmm. at apologetics from a blue collar, per and they use the term blue collar. Each one of them, and none of them were connected to each other. And I thought, okay, well, that sounds good. Well, take it. Let's go with take it. Take it. Yeah. See, I take a black collar. Wow. There you go. It's, it's limits of my. I always tell folks, my mom is dead. I don't have a wife. This is one way to make my clothes match. <laughs> so it's a black collar <laughs> approach. Makes it a little easier. It does. The a um, uh, couple of things that I, I was uh, first start, you know, struck by in your book is you begin with two key points. One, and everybody, I think, across most of the Christian spectrum would, would agree that you begin with the fullness of Jesus Christ Let's start off with that principle. What do you mean by this fullness? Where are you getting that from? Well, it's, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 talks about how Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, which is the fullness of him who fills all uh, in you all. You mean Ephesians 1, What did I say? Corinthians. Oh, yes. Ephesians. Thank mm -hmm. you. See, that's, that's the benefit for being on with somebody who's smarter than I am. No. So, yes, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. So, it, you know, number one, it identifies Jesus as the head of the body, which is the church. 
and it says the church is the fullness of him who fills all in all. And then in, in John chapter one, verse uh, about 16, I believe, talks about how mm -hmm. we receive grace upon grace from his, Jesus's fullness. So that word fullness is, is a key word because the church is the fullness of him and we receive through his fullness, grace upon grace. And I think this is something that we have to have as a beginning principle, the fullness of divinity and the fullness of truth yes. is in Jesus Christ, but he doesn't keep it to himself. Right, right. And as you said, uh, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if the church is the fullness of him, it's the fullness of truth, as you said. And as you said, Jesus says, uh, you know, the great commission in Matthew 28, go out and teach all that I have commanded you. So he's, he's not saying keep it to yourselves, right. you know, and you, you need to go out and share it with others. And truth is such an important concept, uh, you know, just in general life, but particularly in scripture, you know, the truth will make you free. Um, Jesus is the truth. So the more truth you have, the more Jesus you have. Um, Pilate, you know, Jesus tells Pilate, I have come, you know, to bear witness to the truth. And the, Pilate's famous line, what is the truth? Now, you know. he, he really represents so many people in today's world. I, yes. I don't want to call him a patron saint. I think that would be incorrect. <laughs> but he would be their patronal figure. Yes. That, you know, what is true, that cynicism and that, that way of relativism. Uh, that is so typical today. Right. Um, people all say that I have my truth and... You have your truth, I have my truth, they have their truth, but... Uh, and we see, you know, we have to pay attention to the way they still fight amongst themselves. We see this going on on our streets right now. Yes. Over differences of what they believe to be true and they can't discuss it. They right. just beat each other or even kill each other. Yes, that's, but we need to know the truth in order to be set free, set free from sin, uh, set free from the worldliness that we're involved in, you know, to set free to be able to be citizens of eternity in mm -hmm. heaven. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there is no ultimate truth, no objective truth, then we as a society have a problem. You know, I, it, Let's say you know an engineer who, well, he doesn't really buy into two plus two equals four. That's not his truth. Mm -hmm. you know, would you want to drive your car over a bridge that at, that engineer built? You know, he doesn't believe in two plus two equals four, but uh, he's going to build bridges based on his truth or, or, or a doctor who doesn't believe in the, the truth that, well, no, there's only two sexes, male and female. Uh, but this doctor believes, well, there, you know, there's actually, I've gotten up to like 58 different sexes or genders or whatever they want. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're, we're heading for uh, just total chaos in yes. our society right now because of the rejection of objective truth. Yes. And this, one of the areas that is controversial in this regard is to discuss religion in terms of it being true or false. A lot of folks in our society understand their religion as what you feel about right. things, not what you think about them, or there we go even more deeply, what does God think about God? Right. This is, is one of the issues that we have to confront. Yeah, and, and that's, I tell people, you know, who, who, religious people, people who say, well, yes, I believe in God, but again, you've got your truth, I've got my truth about God, or whatever, there's no objective truth. And I'll talk to them, I, I'll generally go to the commandments. I'll, I'll try to go to some moral teaching to see if I can get them to admit that, yes, this is an objective truth. 
And for instance, I'll say, well, what about the Ten Commandments? Um, you know, those, well, you know, each person has their own feelings about this. That. And I say, well, hang on a second. I said, can I see your wallet for a second? And they hand me their wallet. And I'll take out the credit cards and I'll take out the cash. And I'll hand them the wallet back and I'll take out my wallet, put the credit cards and cash into my wallet. They're like, what are you doing? I said, well, my truth is that I need that money more than you do. So we're good, right? He's like, no, that's stealing. I'm like, what do you mean it's stealing? There's, that's my truth. You know, there's no such thing as stealing. And no, that's stealing. Or, um, you know, you find some moral teaching that you know this person absolutely believes in. And, uh, you know, well, what, what if I were to, you know, steal your car or, or borrow your car for the rest of my life? Um, would you be okay with that? Well, no, that's stealing. You know, stealing or, or something else. Or, well, what if your husband cheated on you or your wife cheated on you? Are you good with that? Well, no, that's adultery. Well, but that's okay, isn't it? I mean, what if that's their truth? And you know, so you can, you can, I, I don't want to say you can prove to someone that there's objective truth, but you can definitely plant seeds that no, there is objective truth and you, you believe that. That certain falsehoods can impact my life. And while there really are, it's remarkable, but there really are teachers who refuse to teach that two plus two equals four. Yes. That, that, that's not mythology that actually, that I've seen them uh, just a week and a half ago on television promoting that. But you don't want their students to count out your change at the <laughs> fast food store. <laughs> Yeah, you know that's uh, that's not acceptable, and where this comes in play here, uh, we have to bring it back to these issues. Is we have tens of thousands of churches right now uh, in this just in the United States, not even going to right. other countries, but tens of thousands, and. Do you find that, especially when they have a, a strong belief in the Bible alone, that they are able to come to agreement? No, actually. That's, and that's one of, the, one of the chapters in the book. The first half of the book is called Problems with Protestantism. Mm -hmm. And one of the chapters is there is no Protestant catechism. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, why is, why is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I've had people say, no, no, the Lutherans have a catechism, the Baptists have a catechism, so-and-so uh, has a catechism. Yeah, individual denominations may have a catechism, but there's no overarching Protestant catechism. Why? Because, you know, the, the Catholic catechism is what, like this thick? If you had a Protestant catechism, it'd have to be like this thick. Why? Because let's take the rapture big, big uh, theological teaching. It's gotten a lot of attention in the last 15, 20 years because of the Left Behind books. That and, sold. and Late Great Planet Earth. Right. And one of the most popular books in American yes. history. Yes. And then right now, with all of the trouble going on in the Middle East, it lots and, of commercials time stuff. about yep. the rapture and end times are so, coming up. When I, I first started hearing about the Left Behind books, I don't know, 20 years ago, and people were coming to me and said, have you read these? I was like, no. So I had to go do some research on the rapture and what these books were teaching because people were saying, can you do something on the rapture? And in my research, I, I realized, I said, well, there are those who believe in Protestantism in a uh, pre-tribulation rapture, but then there are those who believe in a mid-tribulation rapture. Mm -hmm. Then there are those who believe in a post-tribulation rapture. Mm -hmm. Then there are those who believe in all three raptures. Then there are those who don't believe in any raptures. It's like, and they're all Protestants who go by the Bible alone. And it's like, well, can't you guys agree? I mean, it's, you're all going supposedly by the Bible alone, but you're getting all these contradictory and conflicting teachings mm -hmm. on the same doctrines and even like uh, salvation by faith alone, which is wh what I call one of the pillars of Protestantism. There are nuances in there that some will, they'll disagree with each other. And I, I've, I'm in a, I, I have an email newsletter I sent out on average 
20, 25 times in a year, so every other week or so on average. And right now, my next one that's coming out, I've been on YouTube talking to two guys who, this one guy put a uh, YouTube video out on once saved, always saved. And this other guy just was like, oh yeah, bro, that was awesome. You nailed it and all that. So I asked the first guy a question about the prodigal son. He had some explanation. He says, the prodigal son, yes, he was saved before he left his father's house. And the whole parable proves once saved, always saved. But I asked this other guy separately, the prodigal son, was, the, was he saved before he left his father's house? No, he wasn't. And this shows that once saved, always saved is true. I'm like, wait a minute. The son was saved before he left his father's house. That shows once saved, always saved. The son wasn't saved before he left his father's house. That shows once saved, always saved. So they're distorting, they're interpreting the, the same verses in different ways, yet because of their preset beliefs, they're coming out with the same conclusion. And that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Well, one of the points that you bring out is um, Christ frequently talked about having authority within the church. The church uh, is the fullness of Christ, and He's the fullness of, of, of truth and, and grace and uh, the fullness of divinity is, is, is Christ. So uh, within the church He established, He gave authority. Right. And you talk about some of the verses uh, with that authority, well, but who has the authority to decide the meaning of the prodigal son and, and, and once saved, always saved, which some of the churches flat out reject. Right. Yes, once saved, always saved is not a uni universal Protestant belief. There's mm -hmm. maybe sola scriptura could be called a universal Protestant belief, but nothing else, at least not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, but authority is the issue, bar none, in every discussion between Catholic and Protestant, every disagreement between Catholic theology and Protestant theology. Mm -hmm. Who has the authority to decide if, you know, let, let's say you're evangelical, I'm Catholic, you love Jesus, you pray, you read scripture, I love Jesus, I pray, I read scripture. We disagree on once saved, always saved, uh, whether, whether we're looking at this verse or this other verse. Who's right and who's wrong? Who gets to decide? That's the question. And the other thing I point out is that Protestants like to say they go by the Bible alone, but they actually don't. The Bible is their indirect source. Their direct source is their fallible interpretation of the Bible. That's what they go by. That's why we have tens of thousands upon tens of thousands of Protestant denominations, because if they were going by the Bible alone, there would be one Protestant denomination. But because they're going by their individual fallible interpretations of Scripture, you get, well, this verse means this. No, it means this. No, it means that. So you get all these different denominations splitting up. Why? Because, again, there is no authority within Protestantism that can definitively decide what this or that verse of Scripture means and what this or that uh, teaching is authentic Christian teaching. Mm -hmm. They don't have it. Yeah. And one of the um, areas where this comes in, while there are the traditional mainline churches, the Lutherans, Episcopalians, uh, Presbyterians, that would trace themselves back to Henry VIII with the Episcopalians, John Calvin for the Presbyterians, and, uh, and uh, along with Knox, and then uh, Luther for the Lutherans. Now, those churches, uh, for the last hundred years almost, have been taking positions flat contradictory to Luther, Henry VIII, and Calvin. Uh, for instance, on birth control and right. abortion, and now uh, on same-sex marriage. These are not positions that are either in Scripture or in their founders. 
how do they come up to decide to make these changes? Well, that's it. Again, they're interpreting each person, each leader of the denomination or group of, of leaders of the denomination comes up with their own personal, private interpretations of scripture. And it says, this means this. And, and one of the chapters I have, the, the second, I have two chapters on there is no Protestant catechism, part right. one, part two. Right. Part two takes exact quotes from early documents, from early catechisms or confessions of Lutheranism, uh, I think uh, Anglicanism, Presbyterianism, etc. Mm -hmm. And it shows from the very beginning they had differences. Mm -hmm. now, and not just slight differences, but major differences. You know, Martin Luther, he, he had uh, very similar beliefs and teachings about Mary, very close to what the Catholics believe and teach mm -hmm. in many respects. Uh, he believed the Eucharist was the body of Christ. Now, uh, you know, cons uh, consubstantiation instead of transubstantiation. But, but he, he wrote, this is my body. Yes. While Huldreich Zwingli, the founder of the Swiss Reform, you know, argued flat against him. Right. And they split over that. And Calvin tried to reconcile, and then both of them rejected him. Yes. You know, and, so, and this so it's split after split after split. Why? Because they're going by the Bible? No, because they're going by their individual interpretations of the Bible, all of which are fallible. One of the first questions I ask a Protestant when I get into a discussion with him, are you infallible? And before I've even asked the question, they've usually, usually said, you, you Catholics with your infallible pope, no man is infallible. You can't have infallible. Only Jesus was infallible. No pope, no, no human being. And I said, well, so that includes you, right? And I, well, you know, they, then they hum, hem and haw, and then they'll, they'll start talking to me, and they say, they'll read a scripture verse, and they'll say, what that means is, and I'll say, wait a minute. You're not giving me scripture. You're giving me your fallible interpretation of scripture, right? And they will very rarely agree that that's what they're doing. But, I mean, at least not directly. So it, it's what I call they're their, their fallible in theory, but infallible in practice, mm -hmm. you know, especially when talking to a Catholic. But again, it gets back to no authority that can decisively uh, render a verdict as to what authentic Christian teaching is within Protestantism. And I think one of the things that you've done very importantly is lay this out, you know, for uh, any reader, Catholic or Protestant, to say, well, then what do we do with this and where do we find that authority? And that's an important uh, part of what your book does. Well, what I have to do is take a break because we've run out of time for this segment. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. I want to get some of your questions and comments, so please stay with us. discussing a new book called A Blue Collar Answer to Protestantism, Catholic Questions Protestant Can't Answer by John Martinoni, our guest tonight. If you want to get a copy of it, you can go to EWTNRC.com. That's our religious catalog. And it is item number 82958. 82958. Also, if you want to find out more about John's work, uh, you can go to the website of the Bible Christian Society. Their website is BibleChristianSociety.com. We just put those words together. And when you go there, you can also sign up for his free, 100% free e-newsletter called Apologetics for the Masses, also at BibleChristianSociety.com. 
Com. I was keeping you busy with all that, huh? Yes, yes. Right. And, and if I may say something real yes, quick. Yes, you may. This book that came out, I'm, I'm going to have to just say, it is the greatest book on Catholic apologetics that has been published in, it, in at least the last two to three weeks. See? <laughs> so. You know, the modesty yeah. is there. It is. But you have to scratch around the ground to find it. <laughs> All right. Well, we have uh, a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Homa, Louisiana. I love it down there. Bayou country. That's it. That's Cajun it. Cajun country. Exactly. Uh, what, what's your question today? Well, I'm curious because... We talk about Protestants and Protestantism, and we tend to lump all non-Catholic denominations as Protestants. Mm -hmm. Where does that term even come from? Thank you, good question. Okay, the term Protestant comes from the, the early, uh, you know, Martin Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, protesting against the Catholic Church. So it's a protest against the Catholic Church and that's what caused the split in Christianity. And so that's where the original term Protestant comes from. And it's usually applied to just what are typically known as the mainline denominations within Protestantism, uh, Pro uh, Presbyterian, Methodist, uh, so forth. Uh, but I use it, Father, to describe all non-Catholic and non-Orthodox Christian faith traditions because instead of saying, well, this is true in with Protestant, Baptist, evangelical, non-denominational, uh, you know, whatever, instead of having this long list of denominations, I just group them all under Protestant because they all use the Protestant Bible. And so if the Protestant Bible... And by Protestant Bible, you mean... The 66-book Bible that you know, Martin Luther came up with when he uh, rejected the seven books of the Old Testament that, that we have in our Bible, in the Catholic Bible, as opposed to, to the Protestant Bible. So the Catholic Bible, 73 books, Protestant Bible, 66 books. The, the New Testament's the same. The Old Testament has seven books that are different. Um, we have seven more. So since they all use the Protestant Bible and they all say they get their teachings from the Bible alone, then that's why I say I just lump them under Protestant, not to, because mm -hmm. there are Baptists and evangelicals who don't like being called Protestants. So it's not, it, but it's not to offend anyone or any, it's just for ease of, of, of teaching and writing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I look at it as three main groups within Christianity, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, um, when you talk about the same Bible, it's worth noting that the, you know, on this issue of authority, the first edition of the King James Bible in 1611 included those seven books. It was put in a separate section, right? But they were there in the 1611 edition, and. Uh, I believe in the, the next one, 1613, they were removed f uh, by a Puritan print shop. Yeah, saved money. And, so, well, saved money. <laughs> also, they were Puritans and they didn't want those books. Right. They rejected the books. Uh, and so then, you, again, it goes back to the question of the authority. Do you accept the authority of synods and councils that recognized the 73 books of the, Old uh, of the Old Testament and New Testament combined, going back to the 300s, as soon as the uh, yeah. persecutions were ended, and repeated all the way up through the uh, Council of Florence in 1437, where the Orthodox churches came together and all, everybody agreed on the 73 books, or how do you have authority 
to remove seven books. What gives somebody authority to remove seven books? Right. That becomes a basic question. And, and that's a couple of questions I have in the book. One is, who wrote the Gospel of Mark and how do you know? Uh, because every, every Protestant believes that the Gospel of Mark is the inspired and errant word of God. Well, if you go by the Bible alone as your sole infallible authority, where in the Bible does it say the Gospel of Mark, that, number one, that someone named Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark, but number two, that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit and that his Gospel is the inspired and errant word of God? Give me, I always say, give me book, chapter, and verse. Well, there is no book, chapter, and verse that says the Gospel of Mark is the inspired and errant word of God. So who are you relying on for your belief mm -hmm. that the Gospel of Mark is the inspired and errant word of God? You're relying on an authority outside of the Bible in order to have the Bible in the first place, which makes sola scriptura a, a logical contradiction. It can't be sola scriptura as your sole infallible source because you're relying on some source outside of the Bible to give you the Bible, you know? And, and so it's like, well, again, sola scriptura just doesn't make logical sense. I one time did a debate in Dallas and my interlocutor said, is there anything in the Catholic tradition that is not already in the Bible? And I smiled and I said, yes, the table of contents. <laughs> yeah. It's, that's only from tradition. And when you look at the, some of the, er, the, the earliest fathers, they didn't have even all 27 books of the New Testament everywhere. Right. They were all known, but not every church had them because of the persecutions. So some, most churches had 22 books but not the same 22. Yeah. And it was Pope St. Damasus I that called it together and right. got the agreement. Well, and that's, before we go to that question, one other question I have in there is, if I were to remove the book of Hebrews from the Bible and say it didn't belong in the Bible, by what authority would you, Mr. Evangelical, tell me I was wrong to do that? You have no authority to tell me I can't remove Hebrews from mm -hmm. Scripture because, again, there's nowhere in the Bible that says the book of Hebrews is mm -hmm. the inspired and errant Word of God. Right. So it comes back again and again and again to authority. Yeah. I have another question. Sir, where are you from? I'm from the Diocese of Toledo, Ohio. Good to see you. Welcome. And what is your question? When you try and evangelize or help a Protestant understand the Catholic faith. They don't want to listen, they want to argue. So would your book or do you have any advice as how do we approach a person like that? that well, in my first book, Blue Collar Apologetics, absolutely yes. I give people four strategies they can use when evangelizing, whether it's Protestants or, or, or anyone else. But one thing I, I tell Catholics to keep in mind is that you and I don't convert anybody. That's the Holy Spirit. He converts the hearts and minds. And if you come upon someone who's not seeking truth, they have a closed mind, a closed heart, then all you can do is throw the seeds out there. And then you hit your knees and pray that those seeds land on good soil instead of among the briars and brambles or on the rocky path or anything like that. So don't put a burden on your shoulders that I have to convert this person um, because no, you don't. Your job is to, to, be, to be a sower of the seeds. But the second thing is, is if they wanna argue with you, then this book here is perfect because again, it's got 30 questions that Protestants can't answer. And when I say they can't answer, they'll give you some sort of answer, but their answer will either contradict scripture or it will contradict their own theology. So, um, you know, so they're kind of left in a theological bind by these questions. So what you do is you can say, look, you keep asking me these questions. You keep saying the Catholic church is wrong on this and this. Do me a favor. I'd really, really be interested in what your opinion of this book is. Could you 
maybe read just seven or eight of these questions and tell me what you think. Well, you know, I'd really like to get your opinion. And number one, what you're doing is hopefully they're going to read the book and maybe have some seeds planted. And since you're not there, they're not going to argue with you because they're reading it in their privacy of their home or office or wherever. And it becomes a, a it's a it's an issue between me and that person because I'm the author of the book, not you and that person. So they're arguing with me, not with you. So that kind of makes you a, a bystander in this, which makes a conversation easier because they can say something you can say, look, I didn't write it. I'm just asking your opinion. But the second thing is, is that if they don't read it and they, they come back to you later and want to argue with you and tell you, you can just go, have you read that book? And if they say no, they say, well, no, no, no. You read that book, then we can talk some more. Mm -hmm. If you don't read the book, we're, we're done talking about this. So read the book and then we can discuss. Mm -hmm. And that way you get yourself out of some, maybe some conversations you don't want to be in because again, that person's not listening. Yeah. And uh, by the way, and just a little word to alert people that if one of the two groups of missionaries that come most frequently to our houses are not Protestants, but uh, in any classical sense, but Jehovah's Witnesses right. who believe that Jesus is not God the Son, but is the archangel Michael right. in, some, in a human form, and uh, uh, Mormons who believe that Jesus and Father and the Son are, uh, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct gods and all Correct. of us have. Jehovah's Witnesses are not allowed to read anything you give them. They're forbidden to do that. They can be disfellowshipped if they do. Right. So you can't really ask them, um, you know, uh, to, to read anything. Uh, you just have to be prepared right. to deal with them in a different yeah, way. Yeah, what I was referring you're to is to, these like are family members, right. friends, people and, you're in contact with. And, and you know, and felt, you know, Protestant Christians are, you know, uh, 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 not like Jehovah's Witnesses no. and stuff. They do have a, a usually a basis of sharing. There'd be some who deny the Trinity, but not right. so many. Uh, most of them have a good basis for discussion. Absolutely. And we can do so respectfully. Yes. We have a caller online. Joe, you're calling from the great state of Georgia. What can we do for you? Yes, good evening. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. First one is, uh, what was the evolution of so many uh, Protestant churches, particularly the uh, non-denominational churches, not baptizing children, infants, or babies, and just seeing, you know, a risk there and uh, and how that's evolved over the year. And then your viewpoint, you know, we've seen the devastating effects and the division of especially the mainline Protestant churches, <laughs> accepting and including homosexuality and, and not calling that a sin. And after this recent synod where so many are pushing for that and not sticking with the scriptures and the catechism, of the Catholic Church, is that uh, of concern and a, a bit of a warning there? Yeah, yeah, well, two good points. Why don't you start off with the baptism question? Uh, the baptism, you know, I can't, I'm not a, uh, a historian in terms of Reformation, theology, and mm -hmm. so forth and so on, but what I can say is that as each successive division within Protestantism, they became less and less liturgical and less and less sacramentally oriented. So for instance, in, in the Baptist churches, I don't know that they even call baptism a sacrament as much as an ordinance. The Lord's Supper is not a sacrament, it's an ordinance. It's not, in other words, something Jesus commanded, commanded you, to, you do, to do, but, but it, it doesn't really do what it signifies. And that is a theology that goes goes back to the Swiss reformer Huldreich Zwingli. Okay. 
that was, again, one of the issues that he argued against Luther. Luther believed in these sacraments, right. at least in Eucharist and baptism. Um, but Zwingli did not. And there was another group um, that uh, didn't baptize infants, and uh, they, uh, the Anabaptists, mm -hmm. and, and they would say you can't, your baptism doesn't count unless you do it after you've made an act of faith. Right. Uh, whereas Zwingli, Luther, and Calvin baptized infants. Right. And, and in fact, Zwingli, would, uh, that's where the fighting got going. Zwingli fought against the Anabaptists. And he said, you want to be baptized again? He would, he would have his people drown Anabaptists. Mm. You know, they would rebaptize them, but keep them under until they died. Um, you know, so these you know, uh, uh, were divisions that were strongly felt right. within the, the diverse Protestant movement. Yeah, and it, and it seems, I would think, as, as people became more and more attached to salvation by faith alone, that, well, an infant can't have faith, so, you know, baptism doesn't really save you, only a profession of faith saves you, so there's no reason to baptize infants because it doesn't really do anything. Right. You know, so it's only your profession of faith. But, and, and so again, within Protestantism, as we were talking earlier, you've got Protestants who believe in infant baptism and that, and, and that through baptism you're, you're regenerated spiritually, you're born again. Other Protestants who say, no, baptism is really symbolic, but yes, go ahead and baptize infants. It's, you know, it's a, it's good, a sign of dedication. It's a sign of dedication. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the ones who say, no, infant baptism is not in the Bible, so no, you're not supposed to baptize infants. And then others who say, well, yeah, baptism is, is immersion only. And others say, no, you can, uh, you know, pour or immerse. Or, and it just, it's, again, it goes back to who has the authority to decide. Mm -hmm. And within Protestantism, there is no authority to decide these issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as far as the synod, you know, I, I think... Oh, yeah, what was the yeah, question? The, the, the question was that you have some folks at the synod pushing to follow the line of some of the mainline Protestants in regard to uh, uh, ordination of women and uh, prom uh, allowing same-sex marriages. And, you know, uh, what you don't see, you have to be careful and do some research. The Pope has made it very clear women are not going to be ordained. It, this is something he has written saying it can't be done, and that's not part of our sacrament of ordination to diaconate or priesthood or episcopacy. So right. he's made that clear, even though some are pushing. Uh, and he's also said that marriage can only be between a man and a woman and for life or until death do them part and open toward procreating life. He's made that very clear. Yeah. And so, but you don't see that in the media. Stick with some of the, the, the Catholic news service to find out uh, a lot more. CNA is much better. Yes, and, and you have, you know, like at Vatican II, you had what Vatican II actually said, and then you had the so-called spirit of Vatican II. Yeah which said, well, the Vatican II said this, this, this. Well, no, it didn't really when you actually read what Vatican II said. Right. And that's what I found a lot with Pope Francis is you'll get the headline, you know, Pope says atheists can go to heaven. Pope says homosexuality is okay. But if you go and read what he actually wrote, it's no, like he didn't that. say those things. Now, you might want to complain that, well, his language isn't as precise as, say, John Paul II or Benedict the Sixteenth, But... It's, it's enough to where you can say, no, he did not say what the headlines from the mainstream media are, are touting. So we have another question, uh, a caller, Stephen Oregon. Yes, what can we I do for question, you? Uh, the question is, how come there's not speaking in tongues in the Catholic Church? Oh, 
That's not true, Steve. There is. I, I am, now I'll, I'll tell you, I, when I first landed in Birmingham, well, actually a couple years after I landed in Birmingham, I got involved with a prayer group where some people were speaking in tongues, supposedly, mm -hmm. and they were, it was just kind of, well, they're making a noise, and I was like, well, the Bible says tongues is a legitimate gift of the Spirit. Now, I'm, I'm not really convinced that they're doing, maybe they are, maybe they're not, I can't say. Mm -hmm. But then there was one time where we had a meeting, it was a young adult prayer group, we had a meeting at a church, one of our regular weekly meetings, and three people had come down from Huntsville, which is about 90, 100 miles north yeah. of here. There were two, two women and a man who were all in their early to mid 70s who were like, what are you doing here? The Lord told us to come to your prayer meeting. I was like, okay, hang on. I, you know, I'm, I'm a skeptic at heart. Right. And, but I was like, how did you find out? Well, the Lord, we didn't advertise our prayer group meeting. So I had no idea how these people ended up. Well, we had our normal prayer group where we had a teaching, we said a rosary, and then at the end of it, somebody said, well, does anybody need to be prayed over? And this one person said, I do. Well, a couple people gather around, put their hands on them, and this woman started praying in a language. You know, I don't speak Russian, but I can, under I can understand it's a language when I hear it. She started speaking in a language, and I heard, Hail Mary, full of grace. But mm -hmm. then I thought to myself, I shouldn't be able to understand her. Yeah. And then immediately I couldn't. And I was just like, oh my gosh, she's speaking in tongues. Yeah. And it was amazing. And, and actually, Steve, um, about 10% of the Catholic Church does speak in tongues. And uh, 10 to 20%. And in fact, there are more Catholics who are in the charismatic renewal than all the Pentecostal denominations combined. You know, so if you took all the, pro, the, the Pentecostal denominations and combined them, there's still more Catholic charismatics. So it's actually very large in the Catholic Church. Yes. Um, uh, I think it's actually more like 20% now. So uh, we've been discussing a blue collar answer to Protestantism, Catholic answers, uh, Protestants can't answer by John Martinoni. Uh, it's at EWTNRC.com, 82958. And John, we are flat out of time, but I want to thank you. Thank you, and Father. And I want to bless you and everyone else. May Almighty God bless you all and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for the support you that makes it possible for us to have these shows by keeping us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. And that way we can pay all of our bills too. God bless you all and thank you.